So thank you for coming along. As I said before, the title of this session is Psychedelic Philosophy. Quick show of hands for who knew the session was titled that before they chose to sit down. Okay, okay. So there's a, there's a few of us who have at least willingly stepped in, which is always important when it comes to psychedelics, you know. That's one of the things where consent and intention seems to be particularly important. And yet that's kind of funny because psychedelic by its very nature is to encounter what was beyond one's ordinary perceptual frame. And so that's a kind of interesting relationship. There's so much talk about set and setting, so much talk about intention towards ceremony. And that's important, right? And yet what we encounter is almost always when it's of sufficient depth beyond. Yeah, it's greater than what we could encapsulate before. And so, this is one of the paradoxes, really. And perhaps that's the role of philosophy, in some important sense, to grapple with paradox, to really be with the tension of it. I think it's quite common in our world at the moment for philosophy to be something that's, on the one hand, seen as kind of lofty, like too lofty, and then also we like to sort of speak down about it. It's like it's all about being buried in books or something. It's not really about grappling with the real of the world and a deep metabolization of reality in the here and now. And that's what it should be in that sense. Yeah, it's a, it's a high art of relating to life-death process. And so that's what I'd like to do with you all today is relate with the here and now. We'll have about an hour together Maybe we can share a little bit together as well. My name's Tim Adlin. And uh, sometimes when people ask me what it is that I do, I say, I'm a philosopher. And that's met with a few different reactions. You know, one is sort of an eyes glaze over, I don't really want to engage. Another can be kind of skeptical. Like, what, what is that? Have you written anything? You know, are you paid to do it? Yeah, because you can't be a philosopher unless someone pays you to do it, right? It's all about being a professional. And yet, everywhere we walk along here, and no doubt in our consciousness at the moment, the nature of our identity, how we relate to each other, how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to the world, fundamentally involves a philosophical process. But what do we mean by that? What is philosophical process? It's wild, hey? It's about as wild as just turning left and seeing like 20 ass cheeks over there doing some sort of downward dog. Well, philosophy is about sort of <laughs> opening up to the world and relating to it in some important sense. It's about processing it in a certain way. But it's not about entirely abstracting oneself, at least in my opinion. If it was just about abstracting oneself and all we were doing was speaking about abstractions, where does that place the one who's doing the abstracting? In some sort of godlike position almost that's denying their very involvement in the process. You know, as if I could speak about those arse cheeks and not in some sense know my own, right? It could be me over there right now, but it's not, I happen to be here. So... Philosophical process, eh? Psychedelic philosophy. I wonder what we think that is. I wonder what we think esoteric means. Yeah, we're sort of gathered here to come to this thing esoteric. Does anybody know what it is? Any ideas? Something different. Yeah, I think that's right. There's a lot of difference, but then also when I look around, I see... A lot of similarity, yeah, I see repeating patterns. And okay, that's kind of interesting. So when we think about what it is to relate psychedelically, that word comes from a, a couplet of words, one of which means manifesting. And so in some sense, psychedelic philosophy is about being present to what comes forth, yeah, paying attention to 
the change of not only what it is we're looking at, but the perceptual lenses that we're using to look through. Said differently, it's about a kind of meditation and coming to awareness of the difference of pattern. And so many of them we don't like to pay attention to, even in a place like esoteric, it seems to me. Yeah, and there's a lot of seeking, and it's a beautiful thing, a lot of desire for connection. And here we are, all of us, on our own transformational journeys. And I'm wondering how they connect. Maybe we come to a place like this to hear some words about the nature of connection. And maybe that's what we're seeking for ourselves, for each other. In my experience, what psychedelic has opened me up to is the kaleidoscope of pattern, that there is simply so much complexity that we're embedded within and which we influence, that it can seem at times almost too much to form a coherent relationship with it. Like, what does it mean to be an ethical person? What does it mean to live sustainably, for example, when we know we're part of systems that are so much greater than us? And these are tremendous tensions, I feel, everyone is navigating. How can we navigate them better? And this is, in some sense, a question of culture. Yeah, what can we turn to in our cultural process to help shape the world to, for us to live in? Is it here? I'm curious what people feel as though they've learned over the last few days of being here. Can anyone share something you've learned? An insight you've had? Something you've appreciated? Go on, brother. Mm. Yeah, totally. It takes time to process. It takes time to process what we receive in. Yeah. That sounds like a spiritual process to me. There's a way of relating to spirituality which sees it as how we process the contents of the world into self, how, how we breathe that through. And what happens after that is in some sense, now we have engaged with a kind of dynamism. We've taken something in. Now we've changed slightly and we're still interacting. And so naturally, how we've then, how we have changed influences how we influence. So in that sense, we're bringing some difference that we weren't bringing before. And what does that mean for everyone else? Now we're talking about what it is to gather together, you know, what it is to communicate, what it is to participate together, what it is to come into formation together. And I think that's one of the things that's with me as a profound tension and a paradox at this moment in my life. As, as, I, as I meet you here and now, you know, a few days ago, I might have come up to say some very different words to this. But I am here now, seeking to reconnect with what this, our being here together, means and what can come after this. People speak about integration that way, you know. What does it mean to bring something home? Or maybe I've had a glimpse of what it is to connect more deeply with myself and now it's time to return to the previous life. What can come with me? Mm. Anyone else? I'm curious. 
any insights, any perceptions, anything that's meaningful, you, meaningful for you to express in this moment, and what this experience here of esoteric means to you. What do you find esoteric to be? Why do we feel like we need to be connected? That's the first part. Why can't we be connected like this all the time? Whew. Anyone else feeling that? Anyone else feeling, yeah? There's a big difference, hey, between, and that's what came up before, there's a big difference between this setting and then ordinary culture. In some sense, that's the nature of what esoteric means. Yeah? It means understood by few. And so if it was to be understood by many, we're speaking about something exoteric. Yeah? And so where does that leave the esoteric? And yet, connection and belonging, home, if that's what we find here, it seems... It seems only right we should desire this for the whole of our lives. Yeah. Well, I think it's a complex answer, and I certainly don't have the full answer to that question. I think part of the answer is to do with truth, how difficult it is to speak it, how difficult it is to relate truthfully with each other, with ourselves how overwhelming so many of the patterns of culture are, and of course, how complex nature is. Yeah? What a thing to even have five days in this kind of environment, a tremendous amount of preparation goes into it. The sun's beating, it's kind of brutal conditions unless you're prepared, you know, people get in heat stroke and various things. Snake just crawled by here earlier on, you know. And so there's a sense in which the culture as patterns of ordered relation which can help us to meet our needs as biological creatures and as sexual creatures and as creatures which desire in some sense to go beyond ourselves yeah, to, um, to transcend in some important sense whether through having children or perhaps engaging in creation. In a sense, we need culture to afford enough security for us to be, and yet it can become stifling and coercive and unable to actually help us meet our needs, and in some sense this desire we have to connect more deeply, yeah, to not remain stuck in a particular kind of loop, to grow, almost always come in, comes into conflict with the structures that have developed to enable us to reach a level of viability in the conditions of nature. And so there's something about our nature which is in a profound paradoxical relation with the structures that we build. I think fundamentally we lack the context in society and that's down to us and we can point to particular structures of power and technology and the historicity of religion and coercion in various ways and confusion that has culminated in a context where it's very difficult to speak about what matters. But we are involved in that process. Yeah. We're involved in that process with ourselves and we're involved in that process with each other, with our loved ones, with our neighbors. And yet there's this third factor, there's this third person dynamic. Again, the structures of our culture, maybe the symbolic order of our time, which can condense the Overton window of what can, 
What's, what, what are we allowed to speak about? Yeah, those things which are taboo and which are nevertheless important things. But we can't talk about them. Or we feel we can't. There's pressure there. And so we don't talk about them and we don't talk about them. And then when we do, maybe it happens in a way that triggers a kind of reactivity and we feel wounded and unable to address ourselves and each other in a way that's really conducive to that connection we're seeking. Because in some sense, the, the gap between what we desire and what we're experiencing is so great and we just don't know how to bridge it. And so what does some bridge look like between what is possible in connection here and the broader context of culture? What can serve as that bridge? And can we consider that without becoming lost in an abstraction and remaining in the here and now. To be the bridge makers ourselves and to be involved in that process. I think this is one of the great questions of our time. Yeah. I'm curious, now I've been speaking for a little bit, what else might be present here for all of you? Yeah, go on then, let's, let's share the mic. We, uh, nice bit of wind today. Hey? Mm. Why don't we just take a few moments to just sit with the breath and just... Enjoy being here in the space. Okay, so how do we connect with, and I don't like labels, but basically someone who's a narcissist? How would you connect with someone like that? And also with people that are um, clearly coercing people into doing things out of fear? How can you, like here we connect, how can you bring, without being, making yourself vulnerable and in a, like a, being in a situation that's going to do yourself more harm? Thank you. That's a powerful question, Aim. It's not clear that humanity has answered that question. I do think some people are wise to those dynamics and I do believe it's possible to live a healthy life. (laughs) More or less. But a healthy system is healthy because it relates with toxins in an effective way in order for the loving transformation of its own context to continue. And yet, if we're speaking about relating with something that might be perceived as toxic, and we use the word narcissism and the idea with narcissism is that in some sense only my voice, only my perception and only how I wish to orchestrate my perception of things, my narrative of things as reality, only that's welcome. In some sense a narcissist is wanting to enforce their first person context however they wish to orchestrate that onto the second person context, which is something inherently shared. And we're sharing in relationship. And so in some sense, in that dynamic, there is a 
an unhealthy membrane relationship. Yeah. So myself, for instance, as the narcissist, not caring about you in some sense. Now, maybe because I can't perceive where you are, yeah? Maybe because it's so difficult for me to relate with myself that everything I encounter reminds me of something which I feel deeply insecure about, right? There's something here I don't know how to love or isn't maybe loving me. This is, it's a tricky thing. It's so easy to demonize, right? And yet, there's such a force, there's such a power in moving through the world with one's own narrative and one's own needs always front and center. It's kind of funny how there's a, there's a tension here because in a way spiritual process is about uh, a profoundly a profound relationship with self again how we process the world through ourselves and that means we matter and you hear people speak about self-love and all these types of things it matters a lot you know but if all we do is focus on that if all we do is focus on ourselves are we bypassing or are we inevitably falling into a kind of blindness about the effects we're actually having on others? In some sense, spiritual process can become wrapped up in a kind of individualism. Yeah, and individualism is a very effective way of moving about in current society. And yet, what does it lead to? Isolation, in some sense, doesn't it? Isolation. I think one of the deep themes that I notice being contemplated by people on the cusp of understanding what comes next in this moment of culture, and often what comes next means turning to the past to try and relate some mythological story to help orient our sense of what could be possible. And so, for instance, we have notions, the likes of Exodus, yeah, where there's a situation in which some group of people are being fundamentally mistreated, and it is for them not possible yeah, to create conditions for their own flourishing and becoming in that particular context, and so they need to go out, they need to brave the desert, and find a new land. This is one story, and at the individual level, sometimes <laughs> when something's toxic, you have to move away from it, right? And yet, in terms of answering the question, well, of course, it always matters about the context. We would have to speak about it further to, to make this in any way personal. And it's funny how when it comes to love, love is the only word, is the only notion I've found to be sufficient to presence on the one hand, like a, a, a powerful affirmation and that holding tight. Yeah, never letting go. And on the other hand, a letting go. Yeah, letting go so that another can be who they truly are, that they can become and choose on their way. It's funny how love draws us in. We want to approach a thing. We want to do whatever we can for it. And we, it's so important to attach in that way, to affirm. And yet too much of it Maybe it's not love anymore. Maybe it's something else. Maybe, maybe there's some sort of attachment that's developed and we're now not loving as we could be. It's a wild thing.
There's no easy answer. We can speak about things like friendship and context to help support us in the process. Different cultures have had traditions and in some sense psychedelics in many cultures have been used as an antidote to the development of narcissism. And yeah, the kind of annihilating experience which can radically resituate a developing individual to recognize the greater than context. Yeah. But how can we relate to that ethically now? It's so curious. It's so, so curious. I am in a place of tension with this myself. There's a sense in which speaking openly in the world I think has always been dangerous it certainly feels dangerous it's feeling more and more dangerous to me and more and more necessary as you share who you are you share what you care about Now you're that much easier to manipulate. But if you don't share it, what then? So there's no way without courage. There's no way without risk. Well, there's more to it too. And I bet you many of you know that. What might be missing here? Is there a next movement we can make? Is there something we can bring into this flow of expression? Hello, Joe. Hi, um, I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about the context of the psychedelics of philosophy and if you see it something as a response to things that are pre-existing in philosophy or sort of a different way of thought about how we should approach philosophy as a whole. Thanks. I think philosophy properly conceived is psychedelic and so like many things in our current world the title of this session is a little bit about marketing. And we all know about marketing, don't we? In some sense, marketing, signaling, it's part and parcel of how we get about. And there's a virtue to it, and there's a value to it. I'm curious how much it obscures. I can answer your question a little bit more directly. There's, of course, a tremendous amount of discussion of psychedelics in philosophy. There's, like many things with respect to psychedelics over the last sort of 80 years or so, there's various absences, but it, it depends where you look. Of course, there's plenty of things where people are writing down stuff about the nature of reality and how concepts fit together and there's lots of thinking, right? And then there's all these buildings and people there. But philosophy is about living together. Yeah. Philosophy is about relating with what is and what could be. Yes, seeking to understand it. But what is it to understand? What is it to see? What is it to relate to that which sees? What is it to risk sharing one's truth? Yeah, what, is it to, what is it to risk sharing what one cares about? The psychedelic aspect demands of us, yeah, invites but demands of us that we attend to the radical nature of difference 
as it comes up for us. And so, hopefully, philosophy can aid in some formation of a more ordered way of relating to the patterns which arise. Perhaps it's wrong to say that philosophy just is psychedelic. In some sense, a psychedelic is about an opening, and then there's also a coming back together. There's the more convergence aspect. There's bringing things to a finer point. There's a kind of crystallization. And so in that sense, psychedelic philosophy would be more on the side of opening with what is. And then the, the degree to which we can relate to the meaning that's present and seek to cohere it in some weave, enabling more of a more of a touch, more of a knowing, yeah, then, then maybe we're doing more philosophy then. I think the kind of psychedelic philosophy I'm interested in is the kind where we, we dedicate together to strengthening a context where it's possible to be with difference and to relate with it and to return in some fundamental sense through a prism of a spiritual process, remain in a relational touch and take responsibility for how we are then shaping our expression into the world, both in terms of words but also in terms of commitment and structure. In that sense, I'm... In that sense, I... I am struggling these days to... speak much about spirit or spirituality without also speaking about religion. And here at Esoteric, there is a very fractured religious context as I perceive it. You know, there's attempts and we go to one workshop, we go to another context and there's a clear pattern of how we can gather together there in some sense but is there a coherence between them? You know, where does it leave us? It, there's, a, there's a sense in which there is a comparatively less conscious awareness of how we are creating structure together uh, than there is put toward how we are relating as vessels, how we are undergoing spiritual process in relation. And I am... I'm just navigating this tension myself because... it's just not clear to me and that's fine that it's not clear to me where this goes. I just... I find myself wanting more. I find myself wanting more. And I'm at a time in my life where I'm not quite sure how to... how to help create that.
And so in some sense, I'm reckoning with what's mine to create. I want to thank you all for being with me in this silence because it's by far the most difficult silence I've ever intentionally shared with so many people. And it's because our culture is one that cannot sit in difficult silence. And I hesitate to say above all, so I'm not going to say that. But I do believe that's something that we need. We need to support contexts for gathering where silence is welcome. Not only that silence which is just right, which has been toned by some high art of beauty, which is so important for nourishment and healing. And something I feel profoundly committed to helping to create. But there's this other silence. There's the kind of silence that one experiences when an event takes place That is this other side of awe, where awe is that too much, you know? And that can be wonder, and it can be terror. There was a question before, why is the connection that some of us experience here in this context, why does it feel lacking in culture? In part, because we're unwilling to be in silence with the power we have and the nature of what it is that we as organisms participating in organism are doing. It's all a bit too easy to ask questions and hear someone profess answers. Care about this thing, care about that thing, this sustainability here, that sustainability there. All, all important, hey? All important. But to be with the silence of really not knowing and staying and holding, that's asking something of each of us. It's not possible for that kind of silence to remain without the intentional process and in that sense the service and the dedication of spirit that each of us carry. What does that make? How does that contribute to the integrity of this field? What then becomes possible in this field that can then shape cultural activity? Right? Is it more responsive then? if we've had time to dwell in it together. That's what we need, right? Responsivity rather than reactivity. You hear people say that. It makes sense to me. I think sometimes psychedelic philosophy is a difficult silence. Of course, a silence filled with a cacophony of noise. It's a difficult silence because we're not sure what sense to make of it. There's too much difference. It's no easy process. In part, that's the esoteric. Yeah.
where difference is that no words can go. Is that where we want to go? Some of us sometimes, maybe, we're all here in this life-death process. In some sense, we're all going there. <sighs> what seems to be here with me, though, and it's coming through in this commitment to be with what is. It's just a presence, a little bit of... A little bit of that I suppose it's a little bit of shadow I suppose it's a little bit of shadow I think it's shadow work what is collective shadow work funny thing to even relate to hey because if we're looking at the thing, is it the shadow then? Because the shadow, well, I suppose it's right there right now. But we generally mean that thing we cannot see. So we can think of the darkness. And for sure, these spaces change when it gets dark. The power dynamics can shift. Energy levels change. Magic happens. Creation happens too, of course it does. But it seems to me that esoteric must relate with shadow. In a manner of a, like a, a critical consciousness, but where it's liminal, it's 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 almost not there, it's not quite formed yet when I think about many of the leaders in the world today of our political system our military system our economic system business futurism the business of futurism influence influences how much time do they spend in a tension of silence where all that shininess, all the bestowed energy of our contextual projection on them as powerful, as influence, yeah, as influences, where all of a sudden Now they are just human, all too human. Not so polished. Isn't that what we need? Though we need leaders who are willing to step into a context and not know. I'm speaking most of all about the esoteric context for that to take place. Because, of course, something like this, something like what I'm sort of sharing now, in many places, this would be almost so absurd <laughs> that it <laughs> probably attention wouldn't even stay on it. You know? It wouldn't even stay on it. It would be too off beat, too off frequency for what's expected. But as we relate to the power we have as a culture, the wars that are taking place, the technological changes upon us, how identity is shifting in relation. Let me think about all the momentum of that. Momentum like a train, hey. Straight to a cliff. How to relate with that? I'm 
Maybe it is. Maybe it is some sort of silence. And yet it has to be a visible silence, a palpable silence. So that the silence can speak and we can be responsive to that. Well, that seems like the close of that thread. So, maybe what would be nice to do is to pass this mic over to someone else, and I am going to ask him to come forth. And then I'll have a look at the time and see how long we have left. We started about 25 minutes late, so we probably don't have too much longer. But I think what I'd most like to do in the interest of psychedelic philosophy is to just say thank you for sharing in this silence with me. And I'm going to pass this on to a very deep and dear friend of mine who has a tremendous amount of value to share. I think, maybe above all, psychedelic philosophy is coming into awareness of just how much the essence of integrity is sharing space. rather than just holding it. And so I'd like to do that. I'd like to share and pass, invite Cameron Duffy to come up. He's a, he's a counselor and a philosopher. He held a session today on relating to conscious awakening. And I'd just like to hand this over to you, Cam, to share what's present for you, and maybe to take this expression on in a way that you feel might contribute to more of a whole making and a transformation of what it is for us all to be here now together in the interest of everyone here. So, Thank you. Um, it's quite an emotional thing to just come into hearing someone say that when you've been in a state of listening and being with that tension, with that silence, knowing that we're all here. I, can't, I couldn't see all of you, but um, I knew you were behind me as I was sit sitting down there. So... I think it's very interesting to be able to watch someone go deep within themselves and fearlessly speak, and not many people, in my experience, can kind of do that with a level of depth and courage as what I just witnessed. Uh, I like to have people like that in my life, because it reminds me that I'm alive, and it also gives me a bit of an activation if I ever find myself going into duller space based on the various stresses that we can all relate to that can send us in different directions. It's nice to have someone in our lives who can kind of activate a part of us that is deeply felt and deeply present in the here and now. So um, it's something to appreciate, even when it does get tense, I think. Since earlier on in the talk, there was a mention of philosophy and with reference to what many people might think of people in universities and the limitations of that, I thought I'd do something slightly ironic and just mention that when you do participate in those institutions and study philosophy, one thing that you work with together is thought experiments and my favorite of all of these is probably, I guess, in the spirit of much of what we've just listened to, really being in a place of realizing that pause, that silence within ourselves, around all of us, what we can see, and just realizing that, wow, this thing, this body, this is a temporary experience. 
You know, we lose people in our lives. We undergo all kinds of changes and transformations. We form relationships, and then we've got to process the grief when those end sometimes. The, the transience of life is both an incredibly sometimes traumatizing thing to be with as it kind of activates these parts of ourselves that just want to resonate with it. And then we lose it. And part of the process of embodying that emotionally, aesthetically, there's a kind of beauty to that transience. And when we take a time to pause, to come back into our breath, and take a break from that busyness of our focus on driving, on doing the things we must do to get through each day, helping out a friend, attending yoga, being at a computer, absorbing all the information, taking a pause to just come back and realize I am breathing. One day this might not be the case, in a sense. Now, one of the things that can open when we bring ourselves into the moment and realize this is transient, this is temporary, well, there's two things really. One is appreciation. Appreciation for what we can do in a moment. Perhaps a sense of courage develops from this place of appreciation. You know, perhaps if we imagined ourselves continuing for another hundred years, we wouldn't be as inspired to act in such a way that there's a bit of fear and that's bringing forth a bit of courage and we're expressing something that is meaningful to express or we're complimenting someone and saying something positive to them just to counterbalance whatever might be going on in their mind that they might be struggling with and struggling to express. You know, there's so much that goes on in our minds that people are not privy to. And I can tell you as someone who's sat with thousands of people and talked about their traumas, their griefs, their everything you can think of as you relate to your own life and your difficulties. There's so much there. There's so much, there's so much enrichment. There's so much resolution. There's so much content. There's so much we share that unites us. Again, coming back to that sense of I am here now and from this moment there's an opportunity to create and as I think we come together and we cultivate the environments where we can actually pause, Tim introducing the silence and the tension associated this with the silence today, when we're able to be in that tension and that silence and pause, there seems to be a space and an opportunity to really feel into what it is to be alive. It's a kind of a strange thing when we get the opportunity to do that. You know, what is this? I can feel my heart. I can feel air moving through my nose. I'm conscious of that, but once I wasn't conscious of that, once I was in a playground like that, just following the colors and the sounds and whatever the interesting things are that I can move on and just experiment with having a body, and through some kind of a developmental process and sheer luck, I survived a few things like we all have and ended up here. <laughs> Uh, so these moments and the way we cultivate them when it comes to pausing, coming back into our breath, understanding that there's an incredible felt presence to being alive and allowing that to inspire us, you know, allowing that to look through a lens which is more than just the constraints the world places on us when we have to pattern ourselves in such a way just to survive, just to get through you know, that's, this is an experience where we can all have, you know. And so one thing I respect about Tim is his dedication to creating spaces where things that are not easy to do, like be silent, be in a place of tension, feel into that and speak from that place. People can come together and they can do that. And it doesn't matter who they are or where they've come from. They can be human and they can be in a place where they can feel and they can touch the process that unfolds. And in my experience, more and more people might find themselves interested in this way of being. It's a new mode of being, perhaps. 
wisdom traditions have talked about various modes of being, and that's a text throughout history. Many of us have read some of that stuff, but that's what we must come into within ourselves, and we must create it. We must co-create it if we want to manifest that connected sense of shared space and the love that can transform all of us. You know, as we honor ourselves, our uniqueness, and we honor each other as experiences of this felt moment, the affirmation that we're alive is both inspiring, terrifying. It's something to breathe through. I'm feeling so much energy in the audience right now, so it's really intense, and I just want to express appreciation for that because it's really special to me, and I can feel all of it. I can feel all of you right now in this moment, and I'm just sitting with that tension, and I'm processing it emotionally, and it's really beautiful. And that's why I might cry, but I might not. But thank you all for being here, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy, and I hope you feel a sense of love in this moment and that you embody that, allow yourself to be with that, and feel free to share it if you come across someone today who might need a bit of that makes life a bit more magical for all of us and that's the power that we have when we come back to our breath and come back to ourselves and appreciate just being.